Coming to you from Crash Studios in Music City, USA, Nashville. This is the Rich Redman Show. On this episode, one of the greatest recording and live drummers of our time, Kenny Aronoff. And now, Rich Redman. What is up, rock and rollers? Yep, it's that time. It's another exciting episode of the Rich Redman Show where we talk about all things music, motivation, and success. Jim McCarthy coming to yeah. us, I-65 South, 30 minutes south of Nashville. How are you doing today, buddy? Just over the border of Alabama. And you're, you're so close. I love yeah. seeing The Shield. I love seeing all the Marvel stuff. It's always great to see you. Like For those of you that are, that are not in the know, Jim and I do like two or three of these things a day. We put them in a queue or is it a quay? And then we kind of drip them out. Today is a special day because like my childhood hero is here, man. This is like one of the greatest drummers of all time. This is our friend Kenny Aronoff and we're going to get into it, but I'm just going to lay it out here. So if you guys have had your head in the sand, I want to level the playing field here. This is one of the world's most influential drummers. Matter of fact, Rolling Stone magazine calls him one, one of the 100 greatest rock drummers of all time. Greatest drummers of all time. I mean, that is a good list to be on. And if you've read Modern Drummer magazine, he was voted number one pop and rock drummer and studio drummer for five consecutive years. Now, listen to some of these names of these people he's recorded with. John Mellencamp, The Stones, Bruce Springsteen, McCartney, Ringo, Tom Petty, Sting, bunch of slackers, The Smashing Pumpkins, Billy Gibbons, Lady Gaga, Bruno Mars, Bob Seger. The list goes on and on and on. And like many of us four thinking individuals he said i'm going to get into speaking and so kenny is doing keynote speeches and the focus of his talks is living your life with your purpose by developing your teamwork skills using innovation your creativity hard work self-discipline and perseverance to stay relevant and to live the life of your dreams if that wasn't enough a few years back he put out this book right that we were all eagerly awaiting for it sex drums and Rock and Roll, The Hardest Hitting Man in Show Business by Kenny Aronoff. Ladies and gentlemen, my guest today, Kenny Aronoff. How you doing, buddy? Great, man. You said everything. I'll see you next week. <laughs> that, that set it all up so just people know like what we're dealing with here. And then we can just get in to yeah. a talk about your book, man. It's so great. I consumed it. There are so many great books. Like, look at, look at our buddy Liberty's got a book. Yeah. You know, yeah. The, the Jeff Bercaro book just came out. Yeah. You know, I got a little book here. You know, it's for sale at Hudson now. I mean, we're we're us drummers, man. We're smart guys. Well, I wouldn't go that far. <laughs> we're survivors. We know how to survive. That's right. You know, you're. It's like you're in the back of the playing field. You know, you have to figure out how to. You know, you know, f execute. You know, figure out, read the whole thing, and then execute and survive. That's true. Now, now yeah. for you, is it, is it a similar story? Because the year 1964 is so cited by so many people that are like, yes, that was the Ed yeah. Sullivan show. That changed my life. I wanted to be a Beatle. Was that right? Is that where you started? Yeah, I mean, actually, yeah. I, was I grew up in Western Mass. I was playing outside. I was just a 10-year-old little kid with my twin brother. And my mom, there was nothing to watch on TV, by the way. So we were out hmm. there playing, and my mom is on the porch yelling, hey, boys, get in here. And I thought I was in trouble, which was usually the case. Yeah. <laughs> so we go running across this big, big lawn, and and I'm coming with my head down. She's pointing to a like a black and white TV set with the antennas because we had no rabbit listen. ears. <laughs> yeah, and uh, and it was the Beatles on the Ed Sullivan show, and oh, oh my God, you know when they started playing, I, yeah, that was the first time I saw rock and roll, and like I said, there was nothing ever to watch on TV. This was like exhilarating, and all I knew is I wanted to be a part of that, and that's you know I talk about purpose. That's when I really would realize what my purpose in life was without understanding what those words meant right. all i know is it was a feeling i i, I gotta do this so that's when i turned to my mom and said mom I, who are those guys she says they're the beatles and i went well i want to play in the beatles call them up call them up <laughs> you know all right and so i mean that's what moms do right and i said and then you know i was taking piano lessons and i went forget about the piano it's drums and my mom didn't call the Beatles up, and she didn't, definitely didn't get me a set of drums. So I started my own band, and I only had a cymbal and a snare drum. As a matter of fact, my parents went, ran down to Manny's. You remember Manny's music? In New York, sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. She got the snare drum down there. And this is talk about back in the 60s. My mom goes, ah, you know, I don't know if my son's any good. He's never taken lessons. She said, 
Mrs. Aronoff, if your son doesn't want to play this drum, you can bring that drum back and I'll give you your money back. All right. Wow. And then, well, so anyway, I played, I started bands. I started just playing in bands. We played Beatles music and that. And then the the, the long and short of the whole story is 50 years later, I am get, get asked by Don wants to do this CBS special called The Night That Changed America, honoring the Beatles for the Ed Sullivan Show. And now mm-hmm. I get to play with the two remaining Beatles, Paul McCartney and Ringo Starr. Can you imagine how I felt? It was just... Yeah. It's just unbelievable. I mean, it only like, took fifty years. You 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 reap what yeah. you sow. You planted that seed fifty years ago. Yeah, I mean, and, incre- and, incredible. Yeah, and 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 you know, to 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 turn that into what that book is about. The book is basically about just a kid working hard and just staying on it and on it, like a running back. A running back keeps pounding it and pounding it and pounding it. They don't get touchdowns every time, but they keep pounding it and pounding it. And at the end of whatever twenty years, they. They look at their stats, and all of a sudden it's like, <laughs> oh, oh, wow, you're one of the greatest running backs ever. But all they focus on is end zone, end zone, end zone, touchdown. And you sometimes you drop the ball, sometimes you break your leg, sometimes it's negative yards. Bottom line is that perseverance, which I talk about, that led me to getting the call 50 years later. If I'd been sitting on my ass waiting for somebody to call me, it would never have happened. Sure. You know, I, I just work hard like you did, like all of us here did. We work hard. I have this thing I talk about called RPS. It's the repetition of any skill is the preparation for success. It doesn't matter if it's lifting weights, sports, drumming, music, diet, relationships. You just, we're humans. We're not robots. You just repeat a skill over and over again, and you get better at it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it reminds me of the three P's. I like to talk about the three P's, which is your personality, your people skills, and your presence, your presence. Yeah. Like put your cell phone down when you're in the, when you're in the presence of other people, give them the gift of your time and, and yeah. you give them your full attention and exceed those expectations. And you took that to high art. I mean, eventually you get this gig with this Johnny Cougar guy. This lasts for years and years. You create a body of work. You, you cultivate a reputation. Yeah. And then you could have just said, that's good. You know, I'm going to stay here or I'm going to just take yeah. this salary. No, you were like on red eyes. You're New York, LA, London. You got to make the effort to get the drum sets there. And then you got to get on these red eyes and lose sleep and go. And then the, the year would end. You're like, well, I did two tours, but I played on 35 records as well. Now, yeah. that doesn't come at for that's not for the faint of heart that's for somebody who has blood and guts and gumption absolutely yeah i mean i tell people i didn't make this car i'm just driving it <laughs> <laughs> if you don't like the car talk to the manufacturer i'm trying to keep four wheels on the road <laughs> yeah. but i mean yeah you yeah i mean back to purpose i mean i mean i was so passionate when I got in the Mellencamp band, and everybody knows the story, I mean, I, I was only in the band for five weeks, and I got fired after two days of recording because, uh, quite frankly, the producer said, that guy has no experience getting records on the radio to be number one hit singles, and he was right. It yeah. didn't matter that I'd worked with Leonard Bernstein, gotten the Jerusalem Symphony Orchestra, and all you know, all this classical stuff. Yeah. It didn't it had nothing to do with playing the drums on the record and getting on the radio. So, uh, but but that was a great life lesson. And when to, to, to when I go back and connect the dots, and I go like, when John said, "Well, uh, you go home," I said, "I ain't going nowhere." I mean, that's like someone saying, Rich, you're fired. And Rich goes, no, I'm no, not. I'm, no, I'm not. And then I go, no, no, you, you, you're you really fired. And then Rich says, no, no I'm going to stay not, here and I'm yeah. going to watch your drummer. I'm going to be a, I'm just going to sleep on the floor and I'm going to watch this guy so I can learn why yeah. he was chosen over me. Exactly. And that's, that's what happened. And, um, and so, I mean, it was just survival. The point is, is that John, uh, by the way, I thought John was firing me. It wasn't John. It was the producer, Steve Cropper. Oh. Cropper was, he had only eight weeks to get this record done. This is when they recorded with tape, so there was no sure. pro tools and <laughs> fixing. So they won. they got to get the drum tracks first. So, uh, so anyway, um, John... Was, well, in my mind, John was taking away my 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 passion, my desire, my purpose. He was taking it away. I'm, I, I made it. I finally made it. I'm 27 years old. I made it. I'm here. And then he says, no, you aren't. <laughs> F you. I'm not going anywhere. This is 
this is all I got now. Yeah. You know, I mean, I I turned down the Jerusalem Symphony Orchestra, which I call certainty because you have a, a paycheck. I sure. turned that down for complete uncertainty. Yeah. As you well know, the music business for a drummer, I don't care how many degrees you got. You got nothing until you got something. It's like if you, <laughs> yeah. become a, if you become a doctor, you pretty much got a gig. If you become a lawyer, pretty much got a gig. If you become a drummer like you went through four years of college at North Texas, you got nothing. <laughs> That's right. I mean, I, I don't mean nothing. I mean, you have no guarantee. You don't yeah, have. No, no one cares. When I when yeah. I was, I established myself as a top drummer in Dallas after I got my master's at UNT, yeah. everybody moves into Dallas and they play fusion and top forty and they do yeah. jingles and you save your money and you move to New York or LA. And so when I moved to Nashville, no one cared about any of that. Yeah. I had to get down on Lower Broadway and get up in that front room at Tootsie's in the window. How much for the drummer in the window? And I had. <laughs> And I had to start from scratch. There's, there's one Dude. thing about that story, though, that you had mentioned. I watched the movie uh, Hired, uh, Gun. Hired Gun, yeah. right? And you told that story, so I'm familiar with it, but there's one thing that you're leaving out. You closed John at some point. What was that? What was the question you asked him? Do you remember? You mean Am at, I a at drummer that moment? or what? Oh, yeah. yeah. What, what happened? Yes, exactly. You, that's very true, Jim. Yeah. Uh, that was a well, John, question, man. Yeah, because what happened, he uh, box, he boxed me into a corner. And also, all right. I could think of was like, well, uh, I'm like fumbling. I'm like, well, am I still your drummer in the band or what? And the rest of the bands, their eyes are bugged out. Like, if anybody knows John Mellencamp, he is not exactly the easiest guy to work with. This is a guy <laughs> that he grew up in a family. They worked their problems out with fistfights. That's right. So, Seymour, Indiana. Yeah. Exactly. I've been through there, man. <laughs> exactly. I've been through there. I stopped and got pizza there one time. And the guy serving my pizza was like, oh, yeah, I'm good friends with John's dad. He comes in here all the time, you know. Yeah, 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 exactly. It's a small town. So, yeah, exactly, uh, Jim. And that's when I said, well, that's when I fumbled around and said, well, I'm going to go to the this, this studio and, you know, the, watch these guys play and I'll learn from them and I'll benefit and you'll benefit because I'm your drummer, right? He said nothing. I'm like, oh, my God. I went, uh, that's when I said, okay, I'll work for free and sleep on the couch. And then he went, Perfect. <laughs> Two thumbs up. Two emoji thumbs up, man. I mean, so, but this is my takeaway from that, and you might be able to set me straight on this, but those one or two drummers, I believe, that played on that Johnny Cougar record that you were watching, I know one was Rick Schlosser. Yeah. And was the other one John Gearin? No, uh, Ed Green. Okay, so Ed Green was on our podcast, and we did it in person in Nashville. And but and now Rick, Ed is still active. What about Rick yeah. Schlosser? Oh, you're gonna love this. I get an e I get an email from Rick Schlosser maybe six years ago. He he. He was like really a great drummer, like the perfect radio drummer, like James Taylor, Linda Ronson, pop music. He decided to focus more on raising his son, single parent, yeah. and eventually moved to, mm. to Mexico. And he emailed me and said to me, Kenny, Rick Slosher, you know what? I knew you. He said, congratulations. He says, I had a feeling you were going to make it. You were asking all the right questions. You were the nicest guy in the studio. You were humble. And he said all the things that I, I didn't know. I was just being me. But he was like so cool that he, that he reached out to me because that was heavy, man. And he, I did. I, I took notes and wrote. What do That's I need amazing, to do to do Kenny. That? I mean, why did he wait 30 years to say, good job, kid? I mean, you've only been know. the fabric of the music business for 40, 40 years. I, I don't know. Maybe. I don't know. Maybe, maybe he didn't have my email address. I mean, back then there was no email. <laughs> That's true. That's I mean, true. Maybe that, that, portion of Me that portion of Mexico just finally got dial up or something. <laughs> yes, yeah, I know. Anyway, that, that, oh my God, those are like moments that are just so amazing. I should say, you know, you know how I, I really uh, got into the recording? Recording thing was, uh, you know, with, I was with Mellencamp for eight years. I, I, I should back up. Obviously, I redeemed myself two years later with that Jack and Diane, that big hit single. Shakas Goodush Goodush. You know, you know, I came up with the triple. I ran out of drugs. To make it different. Oh, I would, no. I would, <laughs> uh oh. 
Ba boom boom boom. And and you're right, to make it different, but also mm-hmm. to bring it into that it seemed like the right musical phrase to bring it into that kind of goo boo go goo boo to go you know, ba boo 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 ba boo. Just seemed like logical to me. And I love it. And you know, I worked so many times with the engineer on that record and he passed. Remember George Tucko. George Tucko. He's he's been gone now a good mm-hmm. Eight years, maybe it might be ten. Yeah. I don't know. But, oh man! Yeah, yeah. He he. Um, actually, he was the engineer on the second half of that American Fool record. Uh, the first half, who recorded those drums, was Don Gaiman, I think, and we did uh-huh. that in Miami. See, see, I, I didn't know. Look at making that record. So you know, when I got fired from that first record, nothing matters would have did. I went home and redesigned my whole business model. Like, oh my god. I got to serve the song, serve the artist, get songs on the radio to be number one. And, you know, like you said, Fusion, I, when we were playing Fusion, it, it's as if we were looking through a telescope. And, you know, was, oh, my God, there's so much out. Well, getting songs on the radio, I kind of attribute it more like now you're looking through a microscope. The other way, it's just a different direction, but that world is just as big as the t- telescope. And I had to just look diff- at everything differently. Well, two years later, I swore I'm going to make the next record. That American Fool record, which won two Grammys and had John's biggest single, that was the hardest record I've ever made. John was going through a divorce. John, I didn't know it, but he was about to lose his record deal. Ooh. I saw John almost die in front of me on a Harley going 80 miles an hour down uh, like a cornfield road. We were on a, on a road going out of uh, where he lived to Bloomington and a dog jumped out and it was just dark. And all I saw was, a, 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 a looked like a motorcycle with sparks flying and then it hit a tree and blew up. And I'm like, we, we slammed on our brakes when he's dead, he's dead. And all of a sudden he's hopping from one end of the uh, road Back over to the other end. He's in he's in panic mode and uh, shock. And um, so he, we're down there a week later making a record. He's in a cast. Of course, he brought his motorcycle down there because he's like, you know. Oh, this is a criteria in Miami? Cri- yeah, criteria. And, um, oh, man, two guys get fired. I almost get in a fist fight with John. John was a complete idiot. You know, uh, you know, oh, my God. It was difficult. But. The point is, I mean, literally, at one point, we're standing face to face, fists are up, and I and he said, "We going, to, we're going to do this." And I went, <laughs> and I basically knew if I hit him, it'll be the last time I see him. Mm. I mean, I just knew. I mean, the ego was going to be you're fired. There's some so, serious self discipline there, buddy, because because. And he is a tough son of a bitch. I mean, yeah. he was smoking a pack of cigarettes a day, right? And just what got up four packs of cigarettes. Yeah, Josh. Yeah, well, he had a heart attack in '94. Did he trim it down to a pack now or quit? I think so. He went. He went to the American Heritage. Wow. You know, it's. I mean, he's just literally. Oh, okay. I mean, we we. It didn't matter if you broke your leg or if people would puke in. We played. Yeah. But uh, one day I get a call. We were doing two shows at, at Jones Beach in Long Island. Oh yeah. And uh, the tour manager goes, uh, "We're canceling the show." I'm like. Oh, I know. We did both shows, and then we had a day off, and then we were going to play a show somewhere. And they said, we're canceling. John's got a bad flu. And I'm like, that doesn't stop John Mellencamp. Well, we toured, uh, took a day off, and then we continued touring, and John was really weak. He gets home and found out he had, he had had a heart attack. Wow. And so uh, wow. that, was, that was shocking. But um, needless to say, I mean, when that record... We, we, to get back to the story, so when we did with the record, I thought, oh my God, nine weeks, I did it. I'm done. I did it. Yes. And then John calls me up two weeks later and goes, Aronoff, Mellencamp, record's not done. We got four songs. I'm like, what? It's like going to Vietnam or Afghanistan and you get and you survive and then they say, got to go back. <laughs> so <laughs> I, so we, yeah. that's when we went back and that's when I met Tutko. We recorded Hurt So Good with Tutko. And that was at a pivotal moment. You'll relate to this, both you guys, since you're drummers. I remember walking in. And by the way, I, I played that left-handed because I was trying to dumb my playing down yeah. and kind of like simplify my playing. So Because I was coming out of the fusion mm-hmm. thing, too. And so I couldn't play it as complicated left-handed. And one day, this is a really tells drummers, man, how important timing groove is and the right beat. One day he walks in and he's got this song, Hurts So Good. So I go, God, I'm going to play it left-handed. I play real softly. And, and John goes, what's that beat? And I'm like, oh, no. He goes, why haven't you played that beat before? That's incredible. I'm like, 
oh my god he thinks it's a new beat and i'm playing because i got this kind of like beginner sloshy on the feel. on the left hand yeah yeah so i was like he loved the feel and john was all about vibe and feel so i recorded left hand and I'm, I'm crapping in my pants because i'm trying to prove myself remember the album hadn't come out the album i'm in the same studio cherokee where i got fired from the the record before now cherokee is on um fairfax here right by the genghis cohen and now it's condos yeah that exactly. sucks yeah. but kenny here's a story for you you're gonna do a kick you're gonna get a kick out of this all yeah. the teaching that we do in between tour dates or during the day on the road I get a kid on a set of drums and I say, you know, the song hurts so good, right? I say, okay, sing that song in your head while you're playing the beat. It's going to make your playing more confident, more solid and more musical. I said, sing the song in your yeah. head. And that's the first song I get every student to play. You know, but now we're getting, we're, we're get, the time is going by so much. These youngsters, the young whippersnappers, they haven't heard the song. And oh, so yeah. I'll pull it up for them. You know what yeah. I mean? It's crazy, but it's yeah. a great, great teaching vehicle. So thank you. Oh, you're welcome. And you know what? Well, you played me? that open handed. Yeah. Yeah. I played open handed. And was, so when you listen to me do the Tom Tom fills, the hi hat's still going. Yeah. So it's like a shaker mm -hmm. because what we, we were being inspired with, at least I was, was back in black, was ACDC. Because we, we yeah. this was the first time we learned how to do less is more. You know, because it goes. <laughs> Ga do ga do do ga do ga 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 ba do ba bo ba boom boom yeah. So the band was like, oh my god, it's got to be more complicated than that. And finally, we chilled out and we realized, look at look at ACDC. They, it's not a lot of notes, but it sounds and feels great. So yeah, yeah and. That song was my my me trying to do a Phil Rudd simplified Charlie Watts but play left handed. Mm. But when I walked in the control room and they had George Tutko had the drums way loud. John, thank God, John wanted to blow every song on the radio that came before him and completely dwarf any song that followed us sonically. by having the yeah sonically <laughs> and have the drums way loud and yeah. so I'm I'm coming in going God man I'm stuck playing this. Stupid, simple beat. Jeff Percaro gets to play, you know, you know, a cool Rosanna. beats and yeah. Rosanna and, and 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 you know Steve Gadd and 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 you know Neil Peart and John Bonham <laughs> and I'm stuck with goo ga goo ga and then they play it back and I go, oh my god, holy! Mm. Geez. I finally it hit me. I went, man, I can feel I every single. Every single vibe, every moment, every thought, every emotion. I, all of a sudden, I saw the validity in playing less is more, and there was a whole other value to it that I, I, you know, when you're young, you just think more is more. Suddenly, I got it, and that was a pivotal moment in my career where I went, oh, okay. And when Jack and Diane became number one, from that day forward, after John would play a song on acoustic guitar once or twice, he turned to me. What do you got, Aronoff? Because I had made the, the, the corporation, John Mellencamp, millions of dollars. Oh, sure. We've all made I, <laughs> millions of dollars. <laughs> I made him millions of dollars. So he's like, make me millions of dollars again. <laughs> oh, my and, God. And that was my career. That was constantly. If you look at all those Mellencamp songs, like, you know, the song Wild Nights, how different that was. It was like, um, it was, yeah, exactly. That was like... I took a, kab a, a kibasa, a minor kibasa with plastic with beads. And the that crasher. Was, the crasher. That, and the really crash. And I used a dreadlock, uh, like a Rick Firth, like coat hangers, you guys, yeah. on the crasher instead of hi-hats. Snare drum was a, a, a plastic gourd with beads as my backbeat. African drum over there. I mean, I just completely made it different sounding. They just compressed it and pushed it way up. And all of a sudden, what? And so... I was constantly trying to reinvent myself, but John wanted me to, and there were budgets back then, so we could spend months and months and months coming up with ideas, you know? Yeah. So I, it, love, I love the fact that, like, I mean, I tell kids all the time, like, look it, buy yourself a damn jambé cajon, some shakers, some tambourines, learn this stuff, because it's going to add this, like, another sonic layer to your drumming. You're going to be so versatile. Someone sees you playing percussion, they'll hire you to play drums. They know vice versa. They know you can double. Yeah. yeah. 
it's it's so it's smart to do. Marketability. Yeah, marketability. Well, I mean, you, you know, I was creating loops for John in the early 90s before we even knew what loops were because yeah. I was running out of ideas and it's that percussion thing. So I took like, uh, there was a song called When Jesus Left Birmingham and we, I actually was doing the overdubs first, not thinking that was it, but what I did was I took a snare drum, a little piccolo snare, and put a little... 10 inch splash on it and then I played with like maybe brushes and blastics like a hip hop beat and I moved the sticks around to get different sonics and then I took bongos and muffled them and then played on top of that then I took a shaker then they took that compressed it and made a kind of a thing out of it and then people put some parts on went to dinner came back and John goes eh swing and a miss and I went no no, suddenly I heard, I went, no, those are the overdubs, John. Let me go out and play a, a, a cool beat. And the beat was just an R&B, like, with all the loops, and it was like, and the bass was like, and I, I, John kept saying, don't go out there, it's a it's weird, so I went, F that, I went out there, and before I got done, the bass player was out there, which means John was like, yeah, and so the percussion thing, I was using that to create vibe before I even played the drums at one point on the Mellencamp world. Yeah. I mean, that was such a big uh, chapter of your life. Was it a good 17 years or something like that? Mm -hmm. And I saw you at the, at, um, at the, the Greek theater because you hadn't seen the band in like... Right, you I were there. I saw you backstage. Something. Yeah. Dude, that was... That was heavy. I'd never seen them live since I left. What were you? That was like about four years ago. That was maybe ago? like four years ago. That was like right maybe after you taught at my LA drum camp. The kids loved yeah. you at MI. That yeah. was such a great experience. Yeah. Thanks, Thanks for doing that. And we yeah. partied afterwards at uh, Michelli's. We had some Italian food. Hey. Of course. You're Italian. Come on. John, Jim, are you trying to, to jump in here? Because I want you to get a question in, buddy. Jim. Well, I was going to tell him that uh, at some point. <laughs> <laughs> he's sleep yeah. is he is he sleeping? No, no, it's good. He's just waiting for the right moment. Is that right? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Jim, Mr. Internet Baldy. The Baldy. Jim asked me a question. Yeah, Jim, Five. you're up. Five. Oh, oh no, Can we still we still hear it. Yeah, we to we totally hear you, man. Okay, so Kenny. Okay. Um, that, that frozen or something? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it was the side effect of Zoom, man. All right. No, we're good. We can hear you. We can see you and everything. Yeah. Oh. Oh, okay. We might have to edit this part uh, there out, was Kenny. A time when you were playing no. with Michelle Branch. Oh, yeah. okay. Uh, well, the mark Michelle, it down, Richard. The Michelle Branch chapter was <clears throat> oh, really uh, a, a, a Michelle a, Branch. You 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 played in the Hard Rock. Yes. In yes. Vegas. And this is, yes. I'll tell the story real quick. When you played with her, uh, we went to go, we had, uh, I had worked for a bunch of radio stations out there that we had tickets to go meet and greet and everything. I had no idea you were playing with her. I, I had certainly knew who you were, uh, but I swear it's the one time I've ever seen a drummer get almost the same level of applause as the artist. <laughs> you remember that? I don't remember you came that. Out on stage and people were like, Wow! Yeah, wow. I do. I was I, like, I was going to my my wife because like, my wife saw you with Miss Melissa Etheridge too. Yeah, yeah, said, yeah. yeah they, the guy's, you know, he crushes it. Well, um, um, you know, the whole Michelle Branch thing was like the turning point in the music business because where you used to have to get the drum tracks first and then they build on top of that. The, with Michelle Branch, I walked into the session that my buddy John Shanks was producing and co-wrote, and we were on the Melissa Etheridge tour together, and they had all everything done. I mean, you know, they had guitars and left and right, keyboards, loops, background vocals, lead vocals, bass, keyboard, everything done. And I and I, I listened to it. And I went, I said to John, "Are you keeping all this stuff?" He said, "Yeah, all right." So to get the drums to fit in sonically I, everything i had wasn't working so i went from a 24 inch kick drum to a 22 took the i had eventually i'm going to speed this up took the front head off had to pack it with a blanket then they put 
a mic about 15 feet away to get ambience, but they needed we needed to get something punchy that was low that would fit into all that crap, all that stuff. Yeah. Same with the snare drum. All right, so I got a mixer. I bring my mix up, click everything. I record. I went. I got it. I look in the control room, and they're all like nothing. And I went, uh oh. This is what I always do. When I see trouble, I take my headphones off, put them down, went right into the control room, said to John, we do, is there a problem? He says, you tell me. I went, oh, my God. Holy shit. All right, so I go up to the, the mixing board, and I go, give me the click track and the drums. Oh, phew. I'm going, whew. I'm spot on. All right, give, nice. me, the, give me the loops, the click track, and the drums. Perfect. I went, somebody's rushing because I sound behind. So I said, give me the rhythm guitars because rhythm guitars, like guitar is like snare drum and hi-hat. So bring that up with the click on top of the beat. Well, guess who played the rhythm guitars? The producer. Ouch. The songwriter. Yeah. So, all right. So you can imagine my brain's going, all right, I'm going. He says, oh, I'm on top of it. I said, no problem, man. You sound great. Don't worry. Because I'm thinking, he could easily say, well, we'll have to get another drummer, you know? So I go out there, and I took the the loops out, took everything out. I put everything down and brought the acoustic guitars up, the rhythm guitars, yep. and played to them and that were on top. And all of a sudden, I look, and they're going, whoo! But so, it wasn't <laughs> flamming with the loops a little? No, when well, they, they kept the loops low. Ah. Yeah, yeah. I remember that period where, like, the loop where there'd be an intro, and then the first verse is this gurgly yeah. lo-fi loop, and then kataka doom, you come in, yeah. and, and yeah. that that model, yeah. you know, I remember that period. That was that was it. That was when it was started. So I mean, I did like uh, Hillary Duff. I did a uh, well, not Belinda Carlisle. She didn't do loops. Uh, that was before that. Uh, you know, like Alanis Morissette. That's right. Uh, um, who, I'm leaving somebody. Oh, oh my God! What's her name? Avril Levine. I did a bunch. Yeah. I did a bunch. Like my happy ending, which was just me playing drums to a loop and a click, and the producer singing. She wasn't even there. This is a crazy story because. So I'm listening. It sounds like a folk song. But I'm like, oh, that's nice. And I said to the producer, what are you trying to do here? He says, oh, we got to make this the biggest, most powerful hit, like. A stadium, I went, holy shit. I can so do I, that. <laughs> so I, I, yeah. So, but I, up. now you're going to relate to this, Rich, because I, I always look at myself as an actor in a, in a movie or a scene. So I'm trying to figure out who, what is my role? Who am I? Sure. Am I Robert De Niro in, uh, you know, Godfather or Meet the Falkers? You know, what am I? So, <laughs> so I'm listening to these loops, but I was being the actor like, I'm in a stadium. I'm in a stadium. And, and it didn't even make sense. Now, here's the part that, here's where drummers can get screwed. So she could have come in, and they're going to overdub everything to me. She could have come in at one point, had a bad day singing, going, you know, I don't like the tempo. I don't like the drum sound. I don't like the drum part. Uh, you know, blame everything on me. All, everybody, they could have blamed everything on me. Instead, it all worked out and it became a number one hit single. Yeah. So to me, that's like shoot, going deer hunting, blindfolded in the dark with a bow and arrow and killing the deer. I mean, it's a miracle. Yeah. <laughs> It's, right? it's so it's so interesting, like like where you are in the creative process and how that can influence things. And you really have to have a strong intuition as a session drummer to read the room and know, like, well, where is this going? What is the ultimate yeah. go goal? And it also, you know, the a, a period of your career that really interests me is when you were in Mellencamp Spam, but you really wanted to start expanding as a session drummer, and you were like really an entrepreneur. You're like a creative entrepreneur, businessman. You're like, okay, I'm going to move a set of drums to Nashville. And yeah. was it a thing where you were like you were consciously going after Nashville, were you knocking on doors and going publishing companies, record companies, producers going, hey, I'm Kenny. I played on a couple number one songs. I played with this guy named Mellencamp. You may have heard of him. Can I be of service to you? Was it like methodical like that or was it just one relationship, one relationship, one? Nashville was exactly what you said, except that I used a fax machine uh, because, you know, yeah, I know, <laughs> there was no emails. I faxed 25 producers. Nice. So I was already, I, I, and I got two drum sets in Nashville. I was already uh, doing a lot of work in L.A. and New York. And I had drum sets there, and uh, pe there were budgets, so people would fly me. But I remember spending, see, John at the Milwaukee Fest, which I'm sure you played, a summer fest up there. Summer fest, yeah. Yeah. So John, at the end of the Jubilee tour, like, 
everybody. I'm. We're flying. We're one of America's biggest acts. We've been on Saturday Night Live four times. We, we've won Grammys. Uh, we we've done the uh, you know uh, we've done every TV show possible. We're selling out arenas by ourselves with no opening act. Wow. Uh, we're in a private jet. John refused to have opening acts. I even turned the Elton John tour down to stay with John because we were that big, and so. John suddenly quits. He said that at the end of that show, hands me a bonus check when there used to be bonus checks. Yeah. And he goes, hey, listen, don't spend this in one place. I'm quitting the music business for three years. Now, he didn't, but when he said it, it was so believable. And I'd just gotten divorced. I had a, a child support, a mortgage, car, you know, the regular stuff. And I'm like, what? I'm out of a job. And I <laughs> yeah. went, and this is what I said to myself. I freaked out that night. The next day I woke up and went, I've been working with one superstar for eight years. Now I'm going to go work with all the other superstars. Yeah. And I made a conscious yeah. effort to go to L.A. And after about a year banging around, because my drum sound was so big on the radio that people wanted to hire me enough so I could make some records. But then I get a call from this guy, Don Was, and he wasn't a big producer. And he goes, hey, man, it's Don Was. I swear to God, I thought he was an Afro... Uh, a black man you know i just i, I, I was like yeah man yeah don was. dig I, man dig it well don was they had they had three uh you know black singers and a sax player i mean i how did i know he says man i'm making this record man with iggy pop i think you'd be perfect for it. i'm like iggy pop i'm like oh my god he says come and meet me down at record plant i go down to the record plant the next day and I see the three background singers, the black guys, and I go up to them and I go, hey, I go up to Sweet Pea, I says, are you, are you Don Woods? I ain't no Don Woods, what are you talking about? I'm like, oh my God, I'm freaking out, like I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, and I go over to these white guys, and I'm like, God, does anybody know when Don's coming, and Don, <laughs> I'm Don. <laughs> <laughs> well, Sweet Pea didn't like that, man. Did you, did you guys bury the hatchet? No, you know what? It sounded like he didn't like it. That's his style. He oh, loved yeah. me. He oh, loved yeah. me. He That's just his thing. He's from Detroit. And um, so I meet Iggy. And did you know that Iggy was a timpanist and a percussionist in high school? I did not know that. Yeah. And he grew up in uh, Detroit, where John is from. And so Iggy just wanted, you know, he slumped down, was just checking me out. And anyway, I make that record. While well, I'm making that record, I'm just focusing. Oh my God. I'm doing an Iggy Pop record. I'm getting, I'm breaking into the music scene. And Don can't come in that day because it's the Grammys. And all of a sudden, somebody says, Hey, you guys got to come in here. Don just won two Grammys. He won two Grammys for Nick of Time for Bonnie Raitt. Nice. Then he wins another one for Love Shack for the B-52s. Nice. Well, then oh, yeah. Don now becomes this guy. It, it producer. Yeah, and so then I get called to do Bob Dylan, Elton John, uh, 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 Bob Seger, who I eventually went on tour with. Uh, Elton John has to go on tour. I mean, just everybody. Then because my discography gets so huge is because he has me do all those TV shows. The Kennedy Centers and all that, right? Yeah. And the Music well, he, Airs he, and all that? Yeah, Music Cares, not Kennedy Center on us, but he Oh, that's Rob Mathis, right? Is that yeah, Rob right, exactly. The Rich Redman Show will be right back. Henry Ford once said that if you need a machine and don't buy it, then you will ultimately find that you have paid for it and don't have it. Nothing could be truer about energy-efficient LED lighting in your business. At Big Dot Lighting, we can show you how a portion of your savings from a commercial LED lighting upgrade will be paid for in hardly any time at all. Until then, you're paying for them anyway. Book a no-cost lighting energy assessment with Big Dot Lighting. At least 30% of your utility bill is waiting to be saved. Go to BigDotLighting.com. Are you a drummer looking to expand your drumming vocabulary or take your career to the next level? You can connect with me for one-on-one -on -one virtual lessons and consultations that are now 30% off. I cover topics like styles, reading music, the Nashville number system, charting, music business 101, and career guidance. Simply send me an email at booking at richredmond.com to schedule. And for more information on all of my products and services, visit richredmond.com. This is the Rich Redman Show.
There's a list I could have sent you. It's stupid. It just isn't possible. It's like everything from Johnny Cash, Willie Nelson, Chris Christopher, the Wendell Jennings, to then the Smashing Pumpkins, but then Aveline, Celine Dion, and then the Buddy Rich Big Band, and then, uh, then you got the, you know, the Rod Stewart's, the, the, the Elton John's, the, and then you got... Uh, John Fogarty, and then you got B.B. King, Buddy Guy, Ray Charles. A lot of this stuff came through Don Was, and I'm playing on like a, let's say, a Merle Haggard tribute right there in Nashville, or the the Johnny Cash tribute, or the Greg Allman tribute. And I'm playing with people I would never have been called to to play with, but because I was the house drummer, I'm now suddenly playing with 500 people I've never played like just the most bizarre people you would never have put me with from from one relationship that you didn't know where it was going to happen and you cultivated it and it seems like a theme where it's like okay you're working with Tutko and then you're working with uh Don Gaiman and then you're working with Don Was and then Rob Mathis and there's these people and they like they can they trust you and they champion you and you never mm -hmm. mail it in for them and they just keep calling you well and yeah Exactly, dude. That's exactly. It's like you don't get we, a great musician or a great anybody doesn't get hired just because of their skill. It's like Don said, I want Kenny in the room because he motivates the room and he saves my sessions. That's just, just not a playing thing. That's a, a personality thing. That's a, a vibe. That's a, a presence. And that's a big part of it. There's so many drummers. How many drummers did you know at North Texas that were amazing, but you've never heard of them ever since? Yeah, there was some. There was a couple that had practice rooms next to me, but you know, and their skill was insane. But just because of personal preferences or their this, their DNA, their makeup, their the desire, the fire, they never went to where the watering holes are, which is New York, LA, or Nashville. And if you're not there, yeah, it yeah, must be present to win. Yeah, and then you know, I mean, look. When we walk into a room, okay, so I call this thing connecting, communicating, collaborating. Okay, I get called to do Elton John session. I walk in, Elton friggin' John, 75 albums. I mean, I walk in, I got to go right to him and say, hey, Elton John, I'm Kenny Aronoff. And then, you know, he hugs me and everything. And now we connect, communicate. So we have a relationship, so now I can go out and we can look at each other and play music. Yeah. But it's got to happen in 45 minutes. It's got to... Yeah. And then the next day, it's B.B. King and Bonnie Raitt. And then the next four days, it's Bob Seger. That literally happened with me. It was Bonnie Raitt, B.B. King on Monday, Elton John Tuesday, Wednesday, Bob Seger Thursday through Sunday, fly to Athens, Georgia, Indigo Girls, which is... I'm the first male guy on their records, I think. <laughs> <laughs> and then fly, fly back... Uh, and do Willie Nelson for one day, four more days with Bob Seger than Bon Jovi, Blaze of Glory. Now, if you think about it, every one of those uh, artists is like a, they're another corporation. It's a separate entity. I've got to, you guys like us have to connect with, you know, we're serving the artist, the band, the engineer, the producer, the assistant engineer, the other musicians. How can I, my, we have one goal, one purpose, and it's only this. How can I help you get the record on the radio to be a number one hit single? That's <laughs> it. It's not about me. It's about them. Uh, sure. Now, but the fun Funny thing is, is and I know you know uh, Jim will agree is that is that this was like perfect timing in time and space and human history and the health of the music business. I call it yeah. the velvet rope cocaine era of the music business, where yep, even if you tried to do that again, no, I don't know if it's ever good. You could have a great musician. I mean, because. Kenny, that you caught fire, like boom, 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 boom. And even if you're crossing all the T's and dotting all the I's nowadays, I don't know if there's that much work. Oh, you nailed it, Rich. You just took the words right out of my mouth. I was fortunate to be in the right place at the right time when the music business had money. There was money. It's real simple. I'm on four records. <laughs> I'm on three records that sold over 40 million copies. For all you listening, the record label's making 82 cents or 85 cents on the dollar times 40 million. So right. they got all this money.
me. They can fly guys like me all over the world, and, and I can spend two weeks in the studio. The studios are two to three thousand dollars a day. Right. You know, I'm going from one. I was flying all over the world, and because the people could afford to make records and do it right, and and then they had money to get the bands on the road. They had money to get publicists. They got had money to 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 make the records. They had money to market to get it on the radio. It took money to make money, but unfortunately, that part of the music business died. People don't buy music's free. Music is friggin' free. So yeah. suddenly, whoa! So that brings us to right now, where this unfortunate pandemic yeah. took the only thing left with to make big money, which was live performance. That's gone. Thank God I got my studio. Right. I started that. 12 years ago when I saw the records business falling apart and I went, wow. Yeah, that wow. was the, the, I remember asking you about that, like that you saw the writing on the wall. It was yeah. like, look at, I got kits in three cities. Um, I think you were still maybe living in Indiana or something yeah. like that. And then you're like, look at, out of the three major cities, I need yeah. to set up shop somewhere. So yeah. you said, I like the sunshine. You got all your drums and you just said, I'm open for business. You come to me. Yeah, and and so like all of us, if I remember the first drummer to kind of create an at home recording facility in Nashville, Tony Mora had a place called the Downtown Battery. He took his garage, he floated the floors, he did the right things, wow. had all the clients come to him, plays on a lot of contemporary Christian records, mm -hmm. and then now it's like you got it's assumed you're gonna have yeah. your own space. Oh yeah, absolutely. It's like that we we adjusted and adapted to the situation, and so that's why probably like you, you know, I can now do my speaking virtually from my studio. Yeah. I had to adapt and adjust, get the right lights, get the right cameras to adapt. I'm doing the same thing with the speaking that I did with the music. You just adapt. I mean, as soon as the COVID hit, I literally made a list of what am I not able to do and what am I going to do to replace it. Yeah, it's that simple, and so that you know, I'm surviving. The only way you grow, yeah, yeah. I mean, th you, you said have, the you key have to go word pain in order to grow. Yeah. Grow, grow is the key word, you guys, because you know uh, uh, the way you do grow is yes, you you embrace adversity and struggle, and Comfort. if you yeah, if you do nothing, it's a math equation. Remember in math, yeah. zero equals zero. <laughs> you That's do right. nothing, you mm -hmm. get nothing. Nobody's born successful. We earn our success, and man, if you're waiting for success to land on your lap, and and I'm walking around and I see that same thing, I'm going after it. You're not going to get it because I'm taking action. I'm doing something to get what I want. Yeah. And if you don't, you're going to lose out. Yeah. You're just going to lose out. Yeah. It's just the way it is. I mean, it's just do or die. Well, I think there's a lot of working drummers out there that, that saw your business model over the last 30 years. I mean, I know it was inspirational for me. It was just like, look, and I'm going to cover my ass. I got kids in LA. I got kids in Nashville. Yeah. I got people that I work with in both markets. I'm going to expand the stuff that I do within yeah. drumming and beyond drumming, but it still fits in entertainment and education. Yeah. You know, yeah. and you just go after these things unapologetically, and you're going to have fucking haters, and you know you're doing something right when you have haters. Yeah. Well, you know what? Come on, ding dong. Have, have you ever had... <laughs> Hey, I didn't know we could swear. I could say fuck off. Do it. Do it, Kenny. <laughs> they're going to think, uh, yeah, I'm Kenny unfuck with a bull Aronoff. Kenny unfuck with a bull Aronoff. I actually wanted to just get one really good F in there to really drive the point home. Fuck! Well, not that, okay? <laughs> <laughs> So anyway, anyway, so, um, yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, it yeah. was a great business model that, that worked out and you're not stopping, you know I mean? In my speeches, yeah. I talk about the growing and changing and evolving. And if yeah. you're rotting on the vine, you ain't making fine wine, you know, to make great music, great wine, you got to change, evolve, grow, stay relevant, yeah. move forward in all areas of your life. And it's exhausting. I mean, I know you don't put in an eight hour work day. You put in a 15, 16 hour work day. Yeah. And at the end of the day, that glass of wine or that time with your loved one or whatever yeah. is going to be more special because yeah. you worked hard. Yeah, it's funny well, you said the, the Marines, adapt, improvise, overcome. Yeah, 
Yeah. Oh, that's that's good. That's a very good one, Jim. You said Vine. God, I wrote the second book that I haven't put out. I, 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 I finished it two years ago. But anyway, I talk about you. Are you are you are you, are you living your life loud? Or are you dying on the vine? Nice. Like grapes. Like you know, it's like come on. I mean, it's if you, if you know, it's basically I completely crush lazy mill millennials. I'm one of the guys. I don't believe everyone should get a trophy. You want a trophy? You fucking earn it. Yeah. That's just the way it goes. I grew, up in that, I grew up in that world. You know, people who think everybody should have a trophy, where's the motivation? Listen, you want to be good at something, you bust your ass. That's it. There's no handouts. There's no shortcuts. You bust your ass. And if you don't make it, hey, you learn from that. But that you nobody, and not everybody becomes a winner. It just doesn't work that way. Mm. Yeah. It just doesn't work that way. Yeah, man. And so, I mean, and so I'm, I'm wired hot. I'm going to be, I'm, you know, I have a saying, it goes like this, I'll never be as great as I want to be, but I am damn willing to spend the rest of my life trying to be as great as I can be. Nice. That's it, man. Does a running back get a touchdown every time? Hell no. But he keeps trying. He doesn't sit there go, oh, oh my God, the guy hit me too hard. What? Yeah. No. I don't no. know how many times this has happened to you, but like we've had opening acts over the years and every opening act that opens for us, the drummer gets married, has to go to a funeral, has to go to a wedding, breaks his foot, breaks his hand, and you get to knock on the door an hour before the show. You're with the opening act tonight. And if we couldn't read music and play styles and play with a click, yeah. we couldn't save the day. Oh and, my God. And yeah. you end up saving the day for the person. And it's one more notch on your bedpost, one more tool in your toolbox, one more story that you can tell. It's incredible, man. This oh, thing I, I, yeah, I couldn't. <laughs> if I couldn't, I think I got a chart here. If I couldn't write stuff out, I, I, I have the worst memory in the world. So I chart I, everything, I, everything. I write everything. every note out. <laughs> I yeah. mean, it's, I, I, I just, how am I going to, I got over there, I got 10 songs to record. Yeah. I don't have time to learn them. So I Kenny, them you know out. what I'm going to do? I have saved every number chart in Nashville and every, um, every transcription and every phrase chart too. I've ever used in the last 35 years. Me and eventually too. I'm just going to. I'm going to put them in a book and sell it. Me too. I would, I, people keep telling me that. The only reason why I haven't done is this takes too well, much Well, yeah, time, take, you need an intern to get somebody to put it all together, man. Dude, I did the same thing. I'm I've got, I, yeah. Yeah, we, I will eventually. It's not the priority, but I, I'm, I'm going to do the same. I, that's weird. The same, we both did the same thing. I, for some reason, I saved these charts. And a lot of them are unsigned artists. Yeah. But I saved them. I don't know why, but maybe. I saved them because they're, I mean, you took the time. It took the time for you to learn the song, chart it yeah. out, go do it. It's part of your life story. And it's like, yeah. you know, it's, uh, I didn't want to throw that's them away. That's cool. Yeah. Me either. That's weird. That's funny. <laughs> that's funny. God damn, that's, that's hilarious. It's crazy, man. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, so. Now, are you in Nashville or L.A. today? Or it looks so like I'm, in, I'm in West Hollywood. I live right over by the Four Seasons on Doheny um, with my girlfriend. She's a fashion yeah. designer, yeah. and we're going to try to most likely get over to Studio City, North Hollywood, Glendale. Yeah. Yeah. You know, eventually, I just, um, you know, cat's out of the bag. I mean, you know, in Los Angeles, you need $700,000 for a starter home, a fixer-upper. So yeah. I'm still yeah. working feverishly towards that. You know, dude, it's, it's it's insane. I happen to buy my house out because I still had my house in L.A. I mean, uh, Indiana, and yeah. I went mm, and I had an apartment out here, and then and you know, apartments are expensive. Oh god! So then I got a second apartment because I needed more space. I went, wait a minute, that's getting close to a mortgage. So I eventually sold my house in Indiana, and I bought a house out here right at 2010, which is good right timing. Yeah, good timing. So, but what happened, supply and demand, every time I went to put a, a, a down payment or an offer on a house, by the time I got back to my place, it had been bought with cash plus 20000 over the asking price. I'm right. like, what is going on? And so then I realized, oh, the bottom, got, it went down to the bottom and now people with cash are buying everything. Yeah. So, I mean, it was hard to find a place. And, and, but that house, when I refinanced a year later after I bought it, went up 70% in one year. My God. Yeah. It's yeah. Incredible. But, you know, it's, it's crazy. But once you come here, as you well know, it's hard to leave. It's a really cool place to live.
Yeah, there's 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 always something around every. I mean, I miss uh, all the kibitzing and things you get to do in this fun city. But at the same time, I spent the last you know six months trying to be as productive as possible during yeah. all of this. You know. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, you do the best you can. You know, I mean, this is this is. I mean, what? Look at like I said, doing nothing, you get nothing. And right. I, I'm the type of guy. At the end of the day, I got to have done something. I've got to, or I, I don't feel like, I feel like I wasted a day of my life. Yeah. You know? No, I hear you. Yeah. I hear you, man. Jim, is this that time of the show? Yeah. We're going to hit uh, you with some random, random questions. Random question. There we go. It's right. the random question, random question, random question of the day. It is a random question indeed. I, I play. Random question generator. You ready? I, did I play on that Can't. song? That was programmed by a composer <laughs> friend of mine. <laughs> it's, an, it's entirely possible. Dude, I, you know what? I hear, I hear songs on the radio and I go, God, that's a cool song, man. Is that me? Who, who, no, I don't even go that far. I go, uh, who wrote that? I mean, I wonder who that is. Then I find out who it is and then I realize I played on it. <laughs> God, awesome. I mean, you, think, you think about it. You, sometimes, <laughs> sometimes it's a couple of takes and then you're done. Yep. I mean, how yeah. would I know? Yeah. All right. What's, hit me uh, with a random, random question. I'm ready. Which, which movie sequel do you wish you could erase from history? Are you going to give me the sequel or you want me to add it? Tell you. No. Oh, which movies? Which, yeah. Tell me what you, which, which movie sequel do you wish you could erase from history? <laughs> oh my god never thought about that it could be like <laughs> jaws to aliens yeah but i like all of them aliens like, was good Give i like another one i like all of them those did uh, you know i maybe what movie would i erase period i can't remember what it is yeah. but that's why i hate it so much i can't Gilly. remember it. uh oh was <laughs> a <So Gilly. laughs> Wait, this is, what, what oh, you know what? I'll, I'll, you know what I'll say? I'll say Ocean's Twelve. That'll be my answer. Oh, all the oceans that you can get rid of. I don't care. <laughs> you didn't get rid of all the oceans. I mean, I'm not a big fan of the oceans. They were clever movies. So, yeah, I'll do. You know what? Yeah, so, sometimes you have to be in the mood for something. Yeah. You yeah. know. So, yeah, so. What do you think, Jim? One more. I'm looking for something. Hold on. He's look, he's going to get a good one. I don't think that uh, I even answered that real good. <laughs> good thing you're editing this. What is something that is? <laughs> what is something that is considered a luxury, but you don't think you could live without? A luxury that I couldn't live without? Wine. Nice. There you go. <laughs> it is a luxury. It. it is a. Every time I see you, where we're like, if we're having a cocktail, you're like, yeah, I'm having. I'm not supposed to be doing this, but I, you know, I'm doing it. <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> everything well, in moderation. Of course, then it also depends on the luxury part. Is the expensive one that you go? Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get that real expensive one. But I, you I, know what? I, I like feel it. like most wine, if it's like between, say, it's over fifteen ninety nine, you're, and then you go to fifty ninety nine. I don't know if you could tell the difference between fifteen and fifty. I agree with you. You not you can't. Look at I got a perfect example. Some guy, very wealthy man. I went, he poured me a glass of tequila. I don't drink tequila, but he said, you're not going to believe how smooth this is. $80 bottle, right? right. He says, now check this out. <laughs> I got a $10,000 bottle that somebody gave me. It, it's, and he says, he pours it to me. I said, dude, that might be a $9,000. I mean, dude, that was not. Not nine thousand. I, I would say that nine hundred. Nine hundred. I mean, dude, that is not all of a sudden ten thousand dollars better or whatever. Yeah. You know, what I mean, it just isn't. It. What? Are you kidding me? Totally. No. Yeah. No. It's the allure. So what I do? I'll go into it's a store. The, the I'll go give me the sale. Give me the twenty dollar bottle that tastes like a fifty. Give me the twenty dollar bottle that tastes like a fifty. I love they love getting those questions. You know, those the wine people at the wine store. I, I thought I was you the only one. I, I thought I invented you. that. Yeah. I'm not the, I'm not the only one that says that. <laughs> <laughs> so Kenny, like I remember when I took a lesson with you in 1999, I asked about everything because even then I recognized yeah. it's not all about talent; it's the big yeah. picture. And yeah. I was like, "What are you eating, man?" So you see, yeah. you're like you're like a scoop of designer protein and then a salad with some chicken breast on it. Are you still eating like a like a bodybuilder? 
Pretty much. Yeah. But I mean, I make I make my mistakes, you know. Yeah. I make I I but but the main thing is it's up here. So uh, you know, if, if you get off the track, you go ah, oh, better pull it back in. You know, I mean, sometimes I'm just dying for some ice cream, so I go I I eat it. You know, who cooks in the family? Are you doing the cooking or your wife? Gina does. She's way better than me. She's from England. She's got that European flavor thing. But, uh, you know, I'll cook too, but pff, nothing like her. Yeah. I'm, the, I'm the type of guy, you know, right. I just throw shit together and get it in my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> I like the presentation. Yeah, Kara's much better. She's like, what do you want tonight? She's like, oh, we're doing burritos, but she's like, I got gluten-free tortillas, and we're just going to do like half of one, and then I got brown rice, and I'm like, now you're talking. See, we can have a burrito, but it's more healthy. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's all kinds of ways to, you know, I mean, it's calories in uh, a big thing and then how much you burn doing exercise. And, you know, the thing is, it's in an interesting transition was on tour. Oh, my God. With Met with Fogarty, it was a two hour sound check, sometimes three at full volume because you said, are you playing full volume? Oh, I can. Oh, my God. Full volume for three hours. Then a, a two and a half hour show. So it's five and a half hours of serious cardio and john likes everything fast on the edge pushing driving if it's not he's like turn around he wants me to kick his ass he's yeah. in his 70s he's like a, he's insane yeah. so anyway all of a sudden i'm not doing five and a half hours at that level so you have to adjust a whole bunch of stuff to st to maintain the, yeah. the the way i want to look all i do i just look in the mirror and go uh oh that's not good yeah yeah, through COVID, I've been just getting up and doing running like five and a half, six miles every day. And I got this Good. little thing called the Mutt Bar. It's just like American made product. It's yeah. 33 pounds, but you can hit most of the major muscle groups. Yeah. And then you do like a little prison workout. Like, so I get next to the bed and I do your, you know, yeah. your squat thrusts and your push ups and your. Yeah. And you could just kind of keep it together, you know? You just keep it together. You just keep it together between diet and exercise. Uh, the, you know, the, the, you got to be healthy mentally, physically, emotionally, and spiritually. You have to be, to, to, and especially now to survive, you know, what we're going through. There's a lot of new things that are happening to us that we're not aware of because we've never experienced it, you know, which affects your whole mental state. So you've got to figure out what it, you need to do. It could be meditation. It could be exercise. It could be whatever it is. Figure out how you can keep yourself up happy yeah. you know you know positive joyful you know not the negative you know yes we should That's get me you and mark shulman on an event, event and we will blow some doors off the freaking place man that'd be awesome that'd be like a triple threat people would be like what just hit us oh my god <laughs> Can you imagine that? Oh, my God. It'd be incredible. Kenny, thanks, man. I don't want to yeah. take too much of your time, but for the listeners out there, this is the book, Go Get It, Sex Drums, and Rock and Roll, the hardest hitting man in show business, Kenny Aronoff. Uh, you like to be found on the interwebs, right? You got KennyAronoff.com, right? What's the best way for people to say, yeah. Kenny, I want to make it in the music industry. How do I do it? Yeah, exactly. Well, my, yeah, of course, uh, you know, you go to www.kennyaronoff.com. It's my website, and there's email addresses there. You can reach out to me. Uh, but then you can follow me on Instagram, Kenny Aronoff, Twitter, Aronoff Official, and then on Facebook. Uh, I Listen, you guys, uh, people ask me, add me as your friend. Well, I tapped out 10 years ago. Yeah, five, I, 5K. Yeah, so I have a fan page. And then, of course, LinkedIn and, uh, yeah, I'm not on TikTok, but those are, that's how you can find me. Yeah. I ain't I'm doing not. TikTok. Jim and I talk about it all the time. He's like, maybe mm. you should try to do it. I'm like, I don't need another thing, man. Yeah. You know what? I'm starting to get like, it's like, wow. I mean, this, have you seen that? What's that Netflix movie? Talks oh, about Social Dilemma. Oh, you know, whoa, whoa, whoa. I took whoa. a week off from Instagram after I yeah. watched that. Whoa, yeah. Oh, they're tracking us right now, Jim. Oh. They're tracking us right now, Kenny. They know our buying habits. They know, I know. what we like. It's scary. It's scary. It's, it's, it is what it is, man. Oh, my God. Woo! It's or scary. It's Orwellian at its finest. Yep, exactly. Jeez. I know exactly, Tim. All right, oh, listen. Yeah, Thank man, you, it's, it, it's been great, man. It's like, you know, I've been, uh, I've been, you know, studying you and learning from you for a long, long time. And it was so cool yeah. to have you at my drum camp. We're right up the street from each other. When it gets safe to see each other through this pandemic, we'll get together and do something fun. But uh, we really appreciate your time, man. 
All right, man. Thank you so much, you guys. I will see you soon somewhere. You got it. Hey, to all the listeners out there, thank you guys yeah. so much for listening. I got an email address for you, the Rich Redmond Show at gmail.com. If you dig the show, subscribe, share, tell your friends, rate, leave us a review. It helps people find the show a lot faster. Jim, as always, thank you for your time and talent. Jim McCarthy, voiceovers.com. All right, keep coming back for the good stuff, and we'll see you next time. Thanks, Kenny. This has been The Rich Redmond Show. Subscribe, rate, and follow along at richredmond.com.